The former president will have his in-person hearing next week and get to see advocate Billy Downer face to face when his lawyers argue for the prosecutor's removal uh, from the case. On Wednesday morning last week, the Peter Maritzburg High Court issued a directive that the hearing will be heard in open court, something that Zuma's legal team has spent the last month motivating for. In their submissions to the court, Zuma's lawyers said the court's proposal to have have the hearing of Zuma's special plea application and his arms deal corruption trial heard virtually was a violation of the former president's right to a fair trial. We're joined now by Mpumelelo Zigalala, who's a legal analyst and advocate. Romeo Ntambeleni, a very good evening. He's a legal analyst. A uh, very good evening to you, and thank you so much for speaking to us. So let's just hear from you, Mr. Tamileni. So given the current public health circumstances, why would a virtual hearing be deemed unconstitutional and illegal? Okay. <clears throat> good evening uh, to you and to the viewers. Uh, no, thank you. I think, no, the basis is the kind of the legal system that we, we have in South Africa. And... Uh, the constitutional rights that you know, are enshrined in the Constitution and the provisions of the Criminal Procedure Act that allows an accused person to be present in their in their own trial. Uh, obviously, there are circumstances where the accused cannot be in their own trial, and you know, those are circumstances where the accused is sick or you will not be able to make it in their own trial. So those are exceptional circumstances, but naturally, you know, you need to have the accused to you know, be present in their own trial. And the court, I'm not surprised, reached to a correct conclusion that he has to be present in uh, his own trial. Mm. And let's hear from you, um, Mr. Zigala. So the National Prosecuting Authority was adamant that the hearing could go ahead virtually because no evidence was expected to be led. So how were they unable to convince the Peter Marisburg High Court of this? I think you must remember that there were two directives that were issued. The first one, after they had made submissions, I think it was at the start of this month, said we are going to continue with the virtual hearings, but I want the Department of Correctional Services or any other party to give me uh, submissions that would impede this particular call from continuing virtually. Basically opening the door of saying that maybe in principle I'm agreeing that this particular trial or this particular process can be heard virtually, but I want you to advise me if there are any impediments which are going to be there preventing us from doing such that. One would presume that maybe those submissions were made or maybe the court changed its mind after considering submissions that were made and then said it is much better that we deal with this particular issue um, with, with the accused here. There may be other submissions that have been there saying that there may be some type of other evidence that may, may be adduced either uh, verbally or everything was going to be reduced only in, 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 into writing. So there, there are a number of instances in which that particular decision could have changed, but it is when the, the, the course direct, uh, the directive or prerogative of saying we are going to hold this particular sittings in this particular manner. But in this one, it, it must be important to, to, to say that in considering the above, the current circumstances that we are faced with, with your COVID-19 security, security concerns, and the manner in which these particular proceedings are going to go, meaning who is going to talk here, actually. Are there any type of instructions that are going to flow from the accused to the legal practitioners? If they are, how easy are those to being able to be achieved? But the most important one of, of all being, we don't want any delay to be continuing at a later stage with regard to this, with this trial. We've been at it for quite a while and we want to complete it as soon as possible. It may be some of the things that the court have considered, but after all the submissions have been made, they've said it's much easier for the sake of completeness and the sake of securing the accused rights that he must be here so that he's able to see and give instructions in, in real time, so to say. Mm. Advocate Ntabuleni, the court has then set aside three days to hear former President Zuma's uh, special plea in which he wants Billy Downer to be removed as a prosecutor alleging bias. So what would this involve just in terms of proving bias? Yeah, yeah I think the, as, as my learned colleague has indicated, the, their case basically is on the papers and they have to actually prove, uh, you know, they have the mountain to actually Prove because as you know, previously, previously indicated, the issues that 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 have been raised have been raised previously 
and you know, have been decided by you know uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal relating to the issues of bias uh, with the prosecutors and the certificate to actually pro you know, prosecute. So basically, those are the arguments that they're going to advance that you know the you know, MPA is biased against the former president, and you know they have to actually prove on their side why they're actually saying so because. You know, the, the whole issue there is the certificate to prosecute, whether, you know, Billy Downer holds the certificate to prosecute with, mm. which we, we, we generally know that he definitely holds, you know, a certificate to actually prosecute. And the issue of bias is, you know, the you know, arguments that they've actually brought in the papers, which is nothing new. Uh, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, that is neither here nor there. You know, it's just a kick for touch. So I believe that, you know, uh, that will pan out when, the arguments are being brought forward you know, before the court. I think, Mr. Zagala, what one is trying to understand is some of the things that are being alleged, uh, political influence and uh, years of uh, uh, persecution may be deemed intangible and difficult to prove. What are your thoughts about this? It, 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 it's going to be difficult using this particular section that they are relying on. As Malina Koleka stated earlier, this is, call it loosely translated, an administrative compliance section of saying, do you have the relevant authority from the NPA? What the, the former president team is seeking to do, is seeking to say, I want to extend the conduct of the prosecutor and render him or through his conduct as not being able to prosecute me in, in, in a manner that is going, not, is not going to be uh, biased or that is still in line with the NPA Act and the Code of Conduct applicable to the NPA. Now, the chances of that, we, if you look at case law, they're, they're, they're a bit slim because, as my colleague has stated earlier, it has been decided way before, and the courts are very clear as to how that particular uh, situation is going to pan out. What mm -hmm. I would worry about the most, though, is that if you are going to rely on the conduct of the prosecutor, then you must be seen as having utilized all the other avenues that are there in order to dispute the manner in which the prosecutor has conducted themselves. So one would ask, is there a complaint with the NPA concerning Advocate Billy Downer? Are there any other concerns that are, or, or, or complaints that have been laid through the office of the NPA or any other literature body? Let's, let's call it the Legal Practice Council, for example, of saying this is the manner in which this particular legal practitioner has behaved. This is the manner in which this prosecutor has behaved. This is, these are our concerns, and we are taking them a step further in, to the court this time and saying, can you please look at this conduct and check whether you shouldn't uh, change a bit from the stance that you've taken or the legal principle that you have and actually allocate the conduct of the prosecutor into the way in which they've conducted themselves. And if the answer to the above is yes, then you must then say, can they be able to continue or uh, you, must, you must get another prosecutor to prosecute me? I'd like you to both stay with us because we are going to tackle another issue in just a moment. But first, let's take a quick break.